Hello, sir. Hi, I see Gary Simpson with us as well. I am. I Hi, am. Gary. I am here. Hi, how are you? Very good. I remember we met in Australia for the book Access to Justice with Patrick Kayser. Yeah, that's right. Up in Queensland. Yeah, in at uh, at Bond right. University. It was like seven years ago, I guess. Simon Chesterman. Uh, yeah, at least. Patrick. Yeah, that was a fun, fun conference. I remember it well. It was nice to Charles, see you again. Charles Sanford. Yeah. Those yeah, kind of yeah. Char yeah, Charles was sort of leading light behind that. And Ramesh Thakur was there as well from the UN. Yeah. It was yeah. a great book, by the way. I, yeah, it came I, out well in the end, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's in the reading list. I, I, I teach separately another course called International Criminal Law, and it's in the oh. reading list there. Oh, okay, good, good, good. Yeah, we must uh, swap reading guides at some point on international criminal law. I'm teaching Absolutely it. Absolutely. Right yeah. So you're, you're in London now. You are with the London School of Economics. Excellent. Yeah, I've been there since 2016. Excellent. Yeah, this is the citadel of international law. I remember, actually, I did my master's there back in the 90s. Oh, wow. It was the, the last year when Rosalind Higgins was still teaching international human rights. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's it was right. 1994, I think, I entered into the master's. And Rosalind Higgins, before going to The Hague, she was teaching human rights. And then uh, came Christopher Greenwood, Daniel Bethlehem. Yeah, yeah. Those people. That's right. That's right. Christine Chinkin was uh, was teaching as well, and uh, we've got uh, Chiloka Biani, uh, Margot Solomon, um, Susan exactly. Marks, all teaching human rights law here now. So it's quite quite a tradition. Um, I think there was somebody called was it Peter Duffy, possibly, who was teaching in exactly. the. Uh, yeah, in the early 90s also. Say, say hi to Kristin Chinkin. She she remembers me well from several projects. I will. I will. Uh, she is actually at the Women, Peace and Justice uh, Center at um, at LSE at the moment. She's I think she's just given up the directorship of that. So I don't really see her that often, but I see her occasionally. I will, definitely. Thank you. So, David. okay, Ankit, is everything ready to start? Let's go. Yeah, I've to got the a part. little overhead I'm going to use. I'm going to speak quite sort of loosely about the no history problem. of war crimes trials. It's not, it's not, it's not a sort of formal presentation. I wanted it to no, be don't worry. Yeah. student friendly, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards. Sure. Okay, Ankit, are we ready? Abby, yeah. Is everybody in the class? Anybody still waiting in the room to enter? We have quite a good presence today. I see the General Society of International Law brought many of their participants. And my honor and my big privilege to welcome an old friend, Gary Simpson. Uh, yeah, we were just chatting of our previous uh, meetings and projects. Uh, Gary has been very influential in uh, international law. He was kind of zigzagging between Australia and London taking jobs in different places, but currently is the chair of public international law in London School of Economics, which of several projects, one of which I'm quite curious to see the result of. It's called Cold War and International Law. And being myself uh, educated in Moscow back in the time of Gorbachev, I will particularly be interested to read the outcome of that project. I think I think we lost Professor there. Uh, hmm. <laughs> Connectivity is becoming an issue for us. Uh, Professor Merotra, should I proceed with the bio? Would you like to? You, you can go ahead. No, no worries, Ankit. OK, so it's my honor and uh, privilege to introduce Professor Dr. Jerry Simpson. Uh, Professor Simpson was appointed as a chair to the public international law at the LSE in 2016 January. He 
He's previously taught at the University of Melbourne, Australian University and LSE and was a Open Society Fellow from 2003 to 2008 based in Georgia. He is the author of Great Powers and Outlaw States, winner of the American Society of International Laws Prize in 2005 and translated into several languages. Law, War and Crime, War Crimes, War Crimes Trial and Reinvention, in, Reinvention of International Law. He has co-edited several books as well and has worked with Indian scholars such as Sandhya Pahuja, which is a great honor for us. He's also worked on a counter history of international criminal justice, the sentimental life of international law, a book about international law's interior life and will be published in the Oxford University Press this autumn. I've had the pleasure of reading the article on this and he has co-authored a study on the Cold War, the lawful integrum forthcoming of Cambridge 2020. Jerry is currently, Professor Jerry is currently working, writing a mediation on nuclearism entitled The Atomics. He is also a fellow, fellow of the British Academy. It will be very interesting to hear Professor speak about the AUKUS and how, how, how is that a new Cold War and whether or not there is going to be nuclear uh, mediation ever and perhaps through the AUKUS. Professor, thank you so much for being here with us in the two-part series of the lecture series. Great. Yeah, thank you, Ankit. And uh, thank you, Professor Kapowski. Um, it's good to see you uh, again. Um, good to see you both and good to see so many people um, on the screen. I can't actually see the faces, but I do know you're there. Uh, and I'm very, very much hoping to engage in a discussion, a uh, question and answer session around some of the themes of today's today's lecture. So uh, today I'm going to try to offer up um, this, count, this what, what you might think of as a counter history of, of war crimes trials or international criminal law, but I'll also draw on to a certain extent a couple of ideas from this forthcoming book that Ankit mentioned, The Sentimental Life of International Law, which is coming out with uh, Oxford University Press in November, but I'll, I'll speak more fully to those concerns when we meet again later on in October. I think it's October the 22nd, I get, isn't it? When I'm, I'm, I'm giving a talk next called week. the... Sorry? Next. I think it's next week. Yeah, yeah. Called the Sentimental uh, Life of, of International Law. Well, that's exactly right. It's next week. Um, but today I want to speak about war crimes trials and in the spirit of the series i think i want to offer some sort of rethinking of of international criminal law through a rethinking of its history or a restaging of its history and in order to do that i'm going to go back to some you know origins of international criminal law which may not be entirely typical um, or thought of as foundational in the more orthodox narratives around international criminal law. And I'll be doing that through a series of slides, which I hope provide a certain degree of, of entertainment. I don't offer these slides up to my own students until about week four or five, um, but I'm going to use them. I'm so sorry to cut you off, Professor. Can you go in full screen? We you be, we're losing the element of surprise in the slides in the current mode. Sure, sure. I haven't put the slides on yet, but I'll certainly see them. I'll certainly give myself full screen if I can. Uh, yeah, here we are. So great. It's still, I did. Is it just for me? No, it's still in uh, uh, the it, edit. It, it wouldn't let me do that because I didn't have permission, apparently. Uh, professor, uh, Professor, you just since you are presenter, so you can just select the option of more actions. So there you can find the option of full screen uh, and focus I've, as well. Yeah, I've just done that, but it's it's not let it's I've I've, I've ticked full screen and uh, I'm still down here at the bottom. It's not it's not letting me do it. So. I, I'll do it. Uh, is it is it fine now? 
Uh, well, I, I, I'm still at the bottom of the screen here on my own one, but you may see me better. I don't know. Whenever I try and do it, it won't let me, it just won't let me do it. I, I press full screen and it stays in that little spot down there. Can the students let us know that? Is it, is this, are the slides visible to all of you now? I haven't put the slides up yet, but that's the slide. Well, the first says, slide. We don't, we don't see the other slides. We see the first slide. Yeah, that's uh, all right. That, good. You can see the slide. Yes, we can. But uh, if, if, if you go on full screen, Julian. then yes. Now you just you just went to Julie Bishop in Manhattan. Yes. Good. Good. Excellent. That's exactly where we were meant to be. So I will continue speaking. Uh, but it's still not in full screen. Just a disclaimer. Right. Yeah. That's just something I seem unable to get done because when I go to full screen and tick the box, it just it just continues to have you two up. Well, well, if you go to slideshow, I'm sorry, I'm being so pedantic. About this, no, no, you must. You must. I'll go to slideshow. Uh, slideshow gallery, possibly. No, on the PowerPoint itself. Oh, I see. Slideshow. Yes, yes, got you. Uh, No, slideshow the the the, th the fourth one on the bar itself. Yeah, from, from the back. Design. Uh... No, if you come down to a slideshow, uh, if you come down to slideshow. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, got you. Yeah. And now if we go to uh, from the beginning, because yeah, you're still there. I, oh, see, I see, I see, I see. So I can do this. Yeah, no. good, good. That's fine. That's that's what we wanted. Great. So everyone can see the slides now. Yes, but we see the black screen. Good, good. But you should be able to see the actual screen now. But if you move to the next one, then perhaps because uh, yeah. the, the black there's not much contrast. Uh, yes. OK, so you see. Okay, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, good, yes. good. Excellent. All right. Let me let me begin my let me begin my discussion then. Um, so, yeah, I want to what I've said there, rethink a century of of war crimes uh, trials. And I want to take us back to what I think of as uh, an originating moment in the, in the 1918, 1919, 1920 period, ultimately. But, but the first thing I want to do is say something about the objectives of war crimes trials themselves, or, the, or what I assume to be the objectives as a, a framing device for this, this history. Um, so the objectives seem to be to, uh, first of all, Console, uh, console victims. So the, con the co consolation offered by trials to victims has become an increasingly important part of the story of international criminal law, or one of its, you might say, its authorizing strategies or legitimating strategies. Uh, the second is to perform a certain sort of justice in relation to the um, perpetrators of war crimes. So this was something that Hannah Arendt was very concerned about during the Eichmann trial, that the defendant be given a fair trial, that justice be done and be seen to be done and so, so on and so forth. And the, uh, the third idea is to, in some respects, activate or engage or give juridical substance to what we might think of as the conscience of humankind or the conscience of mankind. And this idea of a conscience of mankind, which again begins to, to emerge in the early 20th century, is very, very important to the story of international criminal law. So international criminal law, though it's a sort of technocratic, rational project of law, turns out to be grounded on something rather metaphysical, this idea of a, a human uh, conscience or a conscience of humanity. And what war crimes trials 
have done, I think more than anything else over the last century is establish this idea and the accompanying idea of humanity itself as a juridical form. See, for example, crimes against humanity. So that's the story I want to tell. And I'm going to tell it over about you know half an hour, 35 minutes, because what I'm really keen is to hear um, your questions and thoughts on this subject. So um, the first point I want to make uh, before I turn to the first slide is that this is a relatively new project that's become a form of convention or orthodoxy in international law and international diplomacy. So what was new uh, and perhaps exciting in the 1940s has become somewhat routine now. There is an assumption that war crimes trials will be a response to war or transition or trauma. Uh, that doesn't mean they always occur. There was a study a few years ago by Leslie Vindramuri, a colleague of mine at the University of London and um, uh, a colleague of hers, Jack Snyder, which suggested that war crimes trials were not the chosen route out of transition and trauma by most states. Most states chose amnesties. But um, nevertheless, there is now an assumption, in particular in the North Atlantic, that war crimes trials will somehow be applied to defeated enemies. And in order to demonstrate this point, um, and Ankit, can, the, can you see the, you can see Julie Bishop in Manhattan now, I presume. Yes, yes, yes. Good, yes. good. In order to demonstrate this point, I just wanted to turn to an incident in 2015 that I found quite striking in this light when uh, the then Foreign Secretary of uh, Australia uh, came to New York, to the UN, and called for a war crimes tribunal to be established in relation to the shooting down of the Malaysian airline jet over, uh, over the Ukraine. In the previous in the previous year, uh, you'll remember that that shooting was attributed to uh, a Russian backed militia in eastern Ukraine and that a number of Australians perished on board. Uh, Julie Bishop came to the Security Council and called for uh, a war crimes tribunal on the basis that to allow impunity in an instance like this uh, would be a disgrace to international diplomacy and international law. She was supported by other members of the Security Council, apart from obviously the Russians. The Russian use of the veto was described as heinous by the then uh, Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Well, this is interesting because in 1988, a rather uh, similar incident occurred in the Gulf of Arabia when a, a, a U.S. warship shot down an Iran Iranian Airbus with the loss of all life on board. Um, and in that case, Iran did come to the Security Council and went to the International Civil Aviation Authority which described the incident as an accident or a mistake. Um, but when the Iranians came to the Security Council, they didn't call for a war crimes tribunal because in 1988, that wasn't the done thing. So the argument here is that there's been an intensification of international criminal law or the assumptions of ret retributive justice, even since 1988. 88, and that the what I'll call the third wave of international criminal law really begins in the 1990s with the uh, establishment of tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia. The first wave is Versailles. The second wave is what I call Tokyo Berg, the Nuremberg and Tokyo war crimes tribunal. And this third wave begins in the 1990s. So if we contrast these two incidents, the 1988 incident and the 2015 incident, we see in both cases there's outrage on the part of the victim state, Iran in 1988, Australia in 2015. But it's only in the second case 
that the idea of tribunality is advanced by the relevant diplomats, or in this case, foreign ministers. So I think something really changes, and it's a move towards, or it's an intensification of this idea of retributivism or uh, criminalization in relation to assumed enemies. And this move is also a move from thinking of war and some of the events taking place in war as mistakes, see the International Civil Aviation Authority's description of the Iranian Airbus incident, to thinking of them not so much as mistakes, but as crimes. So a subtitle of the talk could be from mistakes to crimes, with the, as it were, the 19th century being the era in which these these uh, incidents were understood as mistakes and the 20th century slowly moving towards the idea that these are crimes with a little mini history of that very move taking place as recently as the period 1988 to 2015. I think it's also noticeable that um, Julie Bishop in Manhattan in 2015 calls for a, a, a one-off tribunal to deal with this incident alone. And that's very much a motif of war crimes trials. If we were to rethink them, we would rethink them not as the expression of rational, technocratic, universal justice, but as a mode of ad hocness or temporariness or provisionality. That each war crimes trial, and this may even go for the ICC, is a sort of one-off moment of discretionary justice rather than the application, rather than the application of something we might call universal uh, justice or universal rational law. All right, so um, here we see the draft resolution that uh, Ms. Bishop um, produced for the Security Council, which um, takes in most of these um, points. You'll just notice paragraph six in the draft resolution, as I say, vetoed by the Russians, decides to establish an international tribunal for the sole purpose of prosecuting those persons. So this is a strange way to develop an idea of general universal justice. But this ad hocness, this idea of discretion, uh, this one-offness I think of as being at the very heart of the field. Think of the ad hoc tribunals created in the 1990s. Think of the, um, the sort of provisional temporal nature of the Nuremberg and Tokyo war crimes uh, trials uh, between 1945 and 1948. Okay, I'm gonna move through some of this more uh, literary material. Um, Though I do end up, I do want to go back to to Versailles initially. I thought I'd begin. Um, I'd begin with this image from the uh, New from from the museum in Nuremberg. Uh, it's actually a, a museum to in in the rally site where Hitler held many of his rallies in the nineteen thirties, and this is the front page of the um, relevant German newspaper. Uh, in 1946, uh, October the 1st, 1946, when just the day after the final judgments on the uh, major war criminals uh, are uh, announced. And this is often announced to be the origin of international criminal law. But I want to go back uh, to another moment in 1915. In fact, if you trace the movement of war crimes trials from my opening discussion in 2015 with the uh, the Malaysian Airlines incident back to 1915, we have exactly 100 years of war crimes trials, a sort of century of anti-impunity, we might say. But I want to start with 1915 and this um, statue in Trafalgar Square just at the entrance to the National Portrait Gallery in London, where you've got the statue of, of Edith Cavell, a British nurse who's executed by the Germans in October 19, 1915. Um, her crime was uh, moving or delivering allied prisoners 
who were also patients in her hospital in Brussels through German lines um, back to the Allied zone uh, to be, you know, repaired again and sent out to war um, or to convalesce in the United Kingdom. So she was doing something that the Germans clearly understood to be illegal and actually described as treason. She was um, prosecuted with a number of other individuals who were involved in this scheme, um, though only two of them were executed. Uh, and it was probably a mistake on the part of the Germans, and the Germans themselves seem to have admitted this, to execute, to make one of these, um, one of these individuals executed a, a British nurse. Her execution on October the 12th, 1915, at the Tier National in Brussels, the rifle range in Brussels, caused um, outrage. Or to put it in international criminal law terms, it's an act that provoked the conscience of what came to be understood at Versailles as humankind or civilization. Lloyd George. Uh, immediately called for a war crimes trial uh, at the conclusion of the war for those involved. And the idea of hanging the Kaiser, in other words, hanging our political enemies, really, I think, took root in this moment of outrage. And as I said at the beginning, international criminal law is founded as much on ideas of outrage spectacular justice and revenge as it is on the application of universal uh, justice to war criminals. So it begins with Edith Cavell. This was not the only incident that took place during the during the First World War, but this, I think, was probably the most symptomatic um, incidents when we look incident when we look at this from the history from the perspective of a history of international criminal law. So the Cavell case um, had two major outcomes. One was that it generated opposition to the war or opposition to the German aggression in, in the United States, where the Cavell case, this is a film called Poster uh, on the Cavell case, where the uh, Cavell case uh, generated a uh, fair bit of uh, debate in the United States about whether to intervene in the war or not. But more importantly for our purposes, by the time the Imperial War Cabinet convened in 1917 to discuss how to approach the defeated enemy, uh, the Cavell case and the case of Captain Fryatt, another individual executed by the Germans, was very much uppermost in the minds of the peacemakers. So. Up until that point, we might say peacemakers had been concerned to produce a post-war settlement of some sort. Think of the Congress of Vienna in 1815. By this time, they had two aims in mind. One was peace and the other was justice. And it was a rather narrow conception of justice involving war crimes trials, and in particular, a trial of the Kaiser for uh, treason against mankind, as Billy Hughes, the Australian prime minister, puts it, or crimes against humanity, as Robert Bourdain, the uh, Canadian prime minister, puts it, or an outrage against civilization, as uh, Lloyd George puts it. So here we have this idea of aggression as a crime rather than simply a sovereign act of war. There were dissenters at the Imperial War Cabinet. One of them, in fact, was Billy Hughes, uh, who said there's no such thing as treason against mankind. One might as well prosecute um, uh, Alexander the Great or Moses. Um, and his point really was that what international criminal lawyers called international criminal law had previously simply been called history or war or the diplomatic system. The Minister for Munitions at the right of my image here is um, somebody called Winston Churchill, who will be well known to all of you, um, a fairly or relatively minor figure at that time, who took a different line and argued for a much more retributive approach to German 
uh, war guilt, namely summary execution, something he was to continue to support as prime minister in 1945, outvoted eventually by the Americans and to a certain extent the Soviets, hence the Nuremberg war crimes trials. So we know uh, that what happens in the end at, uh, at Versailles is that Germany, in a way, is criminalized through the reparations and sanctions clauses in the Treaty of Versailles. But um, in Article 2, 227 of the uh, Treaty of Versailles itself, you see that the Allied and Associated Powers agree to publicly indict uh, Wilhelm, the German emperor, the Kaiser, for the supreme offense, for a supreme offense against international morality and the sanctity of treaties. And I think this is one of the opening moments in the history of international criminal law. But if we rethink the origins of international criminal law, as I'm encouraging you to do, we, we would notice that it begins not in what we might think of as a legalist uh, or even constitutional frame, but in a much more hybrid form. Uh, the Kaiser is being indicted for a supreme offense, yes, but against what? There's no reference here to international law, international crime, or far less international criminal law. Instead, we have an offense against international morality and the sanctity of treaties. And this combination of a sort of moral and ecclesiastical language is, again, very emblematic of this era where the first tentative steps are being taken towards a fully fledged international criminal law. Again, in the spirit uh, of Professor Popovsky's request that we rethink our fields, I would suggest that possibly another origin for international criminal law are the uh, Moscow, uh, Moscow trials of the um, of dissidents, of Bolshevik dissidents from the Stalinist project, the Moscow show trials, as they're known. Probably the most famous individual to have been found guilty and executed there was Nikolai Bukharin, one of Stalin's rivals, along with, along with Trotsky. Um, but I think the Moscow show trials are, again, provocative for us because they're, they, they're suggestive of an idea that perhaps the liquidation of one's defeated enemies through trial is easily understood through the prism of the show trial, the liquidation of political enemies through judicial process, as Judith Sklar might have put it, is something that we see very plainly and clearly in Moscow in 1937, um, but perhaps less clearly in or at Nuremberg and Tokyo, where the phrase used is not show trial, but rather victor's justice, or perhaps a gentler uh, complaint or reservation about the trial than the ones that we're familiar with in relation to Moscow. But again, you've got this idea that perhaps international criminal law is about converting mistakes into crimes rather than applying, as I say, some conception of universal equal justice. No one would describe the Moscow show trials as the application of liberal legalism or the rule of law, but perhaps one can describe the application of liberal legalism and the rule of law at times as a show trial. 1945, of course, is a more familiar juncture in the history of international criminal law. Um, there's a lot going on at Nuremberg and Tokyo, but I think an alternative, uh, an alternative history of the Nuremberg trial, or well, maybe a better way of putting this is to say that the alternative history of the Tokyo war crimes trial is with us already. We have it. It's there in Justice Powell's dissent at Tokyo. And I know Justice Powell is a contentious figure. And I'd be really curious to know um, what you think of Justice Powell's dissent at Tokyo or the, how Justice Powell's standing is in India today. But his 900 page dissent is a really important document and represents itself a sort of rethinking of international criminal law at the very uh, inception of the official story of the field at 
Tokyo Berg. But maybe we can understand the Nuremberg trial as doing something rather unexpected too. Maybe what it does is that it immunizes certain um, certain criminals, that it tells us that certain acts that we thought were unlawful or morally reprehensible are in fact or have become permissible modes of warfare so that we can understand the failure to prosecute individuals for Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Tokyo, Dresden, Nuremberg itself is a way of signaling, and Coventry and London for that matter, and the Luftwaffe bombing there, is a way of signaling that these acts are lawful. So that maybe every war crimes trial is telling us two things. It's telling us that certain acts are criminal, but just as importantly, and very importantly for those of us who want to rethink the discipline, it tells us that other acts that we might have thought were illegal are in fact now understood to be lawful, and that includes the immolation from the air of thousands of Japanese school children. Between 1948 and 1991, the official story in a way falls away. It's understood to be a lacuna, a gap, a period of ellipsis between the two great landmarks of the international tribunals in The Hague in the 1990s and Nuremberg and Tokyo in the 1940s. But I think we can productively reread the 1946-1991 period um, as a moment when international criminal law was simply displaced back into the domestic sphere, maybe a sphere where it belongs, a, a sphere in which, um, or in which in relation to the ICC complementary provisions seem to, seem to suggest international criminal law should be. Uh, the iconic moments of the inter- the, the, the period between the Second World War and the end of the Cold War is probably Jerusalem um, and the trial of Adolf Eichmann. This is, this is in fact, an image of Vladimir Nabokov that I, 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 I use because Adolf Eichmann's, the, Adolf Eichmann's criminal mind was a big subject uh, at, um, at Jerusalem in 1960 and 61, continues to be a big subject for international criminal lawyers, understood through the prism of uh, Hannah Arendt's thinking, and in particular through this idea of hers, which has been thoroughly popularized since the 1960s and her book Eichmann in Jerusalem as the banality of evil. It's the, um, it's the second heading, it's the subtitle of, of her book um, on Eichmann in, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, a report on the banality of evil. Eichmann was given a copy of uh, of Nabokov's Lolita, uh, along with a series of novels by his guards in 1961. He handed Lolita uh, back, saying it was a it was a disgusting book. In a way, it shocked the conscience of mankind. But what sort of conscience? existed in Germany when Eichmann was running the final solution from his offices in Berlin and Budapest. This was a major question and it was a big question in Jerusalem and a question that was never really fully resolved. What I've done with the slide here though is to in a way decenter, like any good rethinking of a historical period, I've tried to engage in a bit of decentering. So I've decentered the perpetrator here, and instead turn to the audience, because the Eichmann trial, in many ways, seems um, seems to or suggests a way of thinking about international war crimes trials, or indeed war crimes trials in general, through uh, uh, through the idea of didactic lib liberalism or didactic legalism. Uh, to use Lawrence Douglas's phrase, that perhaps one of the assumptions or one of the purposes or, or objectives of international criminal law is teaching some sort of history. That's one of the objectives I didn't mention at the beginning of the lecture. But this idea of a 
international legal pedagogy of keeping a record of maintaining some sort of attention on a particular period in time for political or historical purposes really emerges fully uh, in the Eichmann trial in 1960, in 1961. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to take us forward to what you might think of as the third major origin of international criminal law. So one origin would be Versailles, uh, a second would be Nuremberg, a third is this period between 1987 and 1997. I've obviously off offered up a series of alternative origins, the, tr the, the execution of Edith Cavell, the Moscow show trials, the Eichmann case, but I'm looking at really the official uh, major staging posts of the discipline uh, here when I turn to 1987 to 1997. And the only thing I want to say about this move, though so much could be said, and I'm very happy to answer questions on, on this subject, um, is that this period marks the what we might think of as the denazification of international criminal law. It's at this moment that we turn from a sort of obsessive interest in prosecuting aging um, Nazis. And it's striking that there's a 100 year old um, German man about to go on trial uh, in Germany in relation to the in relation to events in the Second World War. Um, surely this is the last gasp of this process. Um, but this moment between 1987 and 1997 marks both the beginning of the denazification period and the sort of dying embers of a period in which it was mainly uh, former Nazis like Eichmann and Klaus Barbie on trial here at the left of this image in Lyon in 1987. And this moment begins with the trial of Dusko Tadic in The Hague in 1997 convicted of having committed, amongst other things, crimes against humanity or murder as a crime against humanity. But around this time, and reported, in fact, at the same time in the newspapers, I have a newspaper clipping from The Guardian, which reports the uh, Tadic case at the very same time as a report comes in from Germany to, to uh, indicate that the remains of Martin Bormann have been DNA identified in Frankfurt. Bormann, in a way, was the last of the Nuremberg defendants. He was a fugitive from justice. He was sentenced to death in absentia, but um, his whereabouts were never discovered uh, or weren't discovered until the uh, late 1990s when his remains were positively identified. So this could be understood as the moment when the Nazi period ends. Though, as I say, the, the, the last, the sort of residue of that period is still with us. And the new period of, uh, sort of denazified international criminal justice um, begins. So, I will end there. Um, I'll just end with a, an image from the Nuremberg uh, war crimes trial, the court, which I visited for the, I think the third time recently. And I took this, uh, this photograph of the, the courtroom. The, the, the standard image of the Nuremberg trial is that courtroom on the left. Um, I think that's the photograph we often often see from the outside um, but the courtroom actually stands just just straight ahead there and the I know I know that the people who run the the courts and the museum are very keen to have this this um, pit stop removed to re-establish the grandeur of international criminal law but perhaps the pit stop tells us a lot about where we are in the history of international criminal law today Okay, well, thank you very much for attending thank to you, the lecture. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for this uh, excellent historical uh, voyage through the so many attempts to develop international criminal law and uh, brilliantly brought together into one lecture. Uh, <laughs> probably the first time I see so many cases in one lecture. And 
the idea to find the connections here and to rethink what we understand from the past and how to apply that in the present and in the future is amazing, I must say. So again, th thank you very much for bringing so, so many things into one lecture, which obviously will create a lot of questions, I'm sure, among students. But before that, let me simply, again, for the, for the students primarily, uh, try to kind of define the different uh, crimes under the jurisdiction of tribunals here, somehow to make sure that students understand the differences and how those were developed over the time. Uh, on one hand, what we today have as a crime of aggression, uh, as you correctly pointed, used to be called uh, in the time of the uh, Leipzig trial or the, the, the Versailles Treaty, the supreme offense against international morality and sanctity of treaties. Effectively, probably what they meant was that the Kaiser uh, Wilhelm II was the one who started the First World War. At that time, obviously, the crime against peace, as we see it in uh, Nuremberg, or the crime of aggression, as we see it today in the Rome Statute of the ICC, didn't exist. So th th those people there had to imagine <laughs> to put it this way, they had to create something that did not exist. They had to create uh, a law that, uh, and, and for that matter, they had to violate the principle of legality because somebody cannot be prosecuted, as we know, under the current standard for a crime that is not written in any legal text. And here, I, I think that that's what explains, as you correctly pointed, that it's not a law, it's probably uh, a morality that they call it supreme offense against international morality and sanctity of the treaties exactly because the law did not exist. But the action of those people was shocking the human consciousness. So if we remember Fyodor Martens, a Russian diplomat during the Hague Convention uh, con conference back in 1899, uh, put that language, which became very famous afterwards as the Martens uh, clause, as the Martens formula, that in the absence of law, uh, there are still acts that uh, are shocking to the human consciousness and those acts need to be addressed. So the crimes against uh, peace developed very much out of Article 227 of the Versailles Treaty and that first uh, idea that someone in charge of a large country who commit the act of aggression can be uh, prosecuted in a court of law. If we take, so crime of aggression, uh, if we take war crimes, uh, again, historically, war crimes have been also kind of confused between use ad bellum and use in bello. Uh, some would say that the, the two together will probably qualify as a war crimes. But at least in the Rome Statute of the ICC, we see war crimes simply limited to the violations of the laws of war, to the violations of international humanitarian law. These are the Hay Convention, the Geneva Convention. So very clearly, uh, treaty violations. So uh, these are acts that fall under the grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions uh, or other violations of the laws of war. Basically, uh, acts committed in violation of use in bylaw. And then comes the most interesting, for me at least, in my uh, research and writing, crimes against humanity. Uh, that development, again, we can uh, very correctly, as you, as you see, uh, put it back into the world of Fyodor Martens, that these are acts shocking human consciousness. Uh, they were very much developed not through the treaties and conventions, rather than through the customary law. Uh, and then in the, in the time of, um, uh, in the time of Nuremberg, uh, we have that jurisdiction already put separately, but at the time still uh, linked with the 
war itself, so the crimes against humanity were very much seen as part of the war at that time. The nexus between crimes against humanity and the war was very clearly established. And that has also changed. Today, we don't see crimes against humanity necessarily being put together with war crimes. They can happen at peacetime, they can happen at any time. So uh, I think that distinction today, which we have only today, but not in the past, is, is important. And the other distinction, which I want to kind of also just point to the students, some of the cases you mentioned, Gary, are from domestic trials and some are from international trials. Obviously, Eichmann in 1961, Klaus Barbier in 1987, Bormann in Frankfurt. These are domestic tribunals prosecuting international crimes. Uh, and there is a long history there as well. Uh, Pinochet, uh, more recently, we had uh, a dictator of uh, Chad also being prosecuted in Senegal under the universal jurisdiction. So domestic tribunals can take cases under the universal jurisdiction. And often this is probably the best way to do that because these are very clearly tribunals established into the constitutionalism of every of those countries. There are no questions about their legality uh, generally. And But some of the cases, as you pointed out, Tadic in uh, Yugoslavia uh, and many more afterwards with uh, Rwanda and, and the ICC, we have international tribunals also prosecuting international crimes. Uh, where the jurisdiction itself has developed uh, with more recent uh, uh, judgments, uh, specifically on genocide, on uh, sexual violence as part of genocide in, in several cases in Rwanda and so on. So j j just kind of to make a bit, to bring a bit of a clarity here between the types of jurisdictions and the type of tribunals that we, we might have to prosecute uh, war crimes. Uh, th thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased to open the discussion and to ask students to raise uh, their questions now. Ankit, if, if, you, if you can facilitate that, uh, seeing hands up, and because I might not see everybody who is uh, asking questions. So please go ahead. That's, that's, um, there, are, there are two hands raised, so we take those first. There were a couple as well, but, but they've been lower. So if they're still interested, then please uh, you can send them in the chat as well. I do have a question, but I'll reserve mine. Uh, I'll let Harsh, Harsh speak. So Harsh, the floor is yours. Then we'll have Pragna who can speak and uh, share her question. So Harsh, the floor is yours. Hi, am I audible to everyone? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, this was a great lecture. Um, I have a question that kind of requires a personal view of yours. If you don't mind, I'll go ahead with it. Mm, sure. Okay, so the photo that we can see on the screen is, I'd assume it to be a little bit recent, not, too, not from too long ago. And can there be an argument that says that the first, that uh, a few decades after the Nuremberg trials were actually Support, they should have been used to develop international criminal law much further. However, the period of progress, that period, the progress during that period was quite slow. So any reason as to why this ended up taking place? Yeah, uh, very good question. Can you can you hear me, Ankit? Yes, I can hear you. If you want, we can take all questions together and you can answer them or or you can answer this and then we can have the next one. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Yeah. Um, is it possible to see people when they ask the questions or is that just too difficult on Microsoft Teams? Uh, well, that's there. They can have their cameras. Turn yeah. on. You great, great. Good, if good. good want, can, that's useful. If you want, you can uh, lower the presentation so that your face is enlarged because yours is microscopic right now. Yeah, I see. I, I can't quite seem to do that, but... Uh, sure, that's fine. Then, then we can mind. see it. Uh, never mind. Mine is rather small. After. Yeah, um, very good question. Um, and not... Uh, there's a simple answer to the question and probably a lot of more complicated answers, but one answer to the question that's often given 
uh, is that is that the Cold War uh, and the rivalry between the great powers prevented collective action uh, in the field of war crimes trials, and in particular in relation to aggression, where, you know, after all, the United States was accusing the Soviet Union of aggression, the Soviets were accusing the Americans of aggression, they both wanted to commit acts that we might think of as aggression under the Nuremberg War Crimes Charter. So there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for using uh, international criminal law in anything but a kind of instrumental or rhetorical sense because of this 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 breakdown. Um, I suppose the other reason for this is because there was the sort of criminality that might be prosecuted in this period was often being committed by the very colonial powers that might potentially um, be required to institute the trials or fund the trials in the first place. And then even more confusingly, the West was beginning to use former Nazis in an intelligence role um, against the Soviets. So people who might otherwise have ended up on trial in Germany um, were recruited as spies for the CIA and the British intelligence agencies in order to fight the this sometimes imagined Cold War. And, you know, Germany itself, um, in the immediate period after the war, lost its enthusiasm for war crimes trials and was more interested in rebuilding its society. But there was a, I mean, as I said in the, in the lecture, and it's a good question that you asked, but as I said in the lecture, I think it's probably worthwhile thinking, and this is something that um, Professor Popovsky said in, 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 in his comments afterwards, that it's useful to think of international criminal law as a combination of international law and domestic law. Most of its landmarks are both. If you think about the big cases, then you, know, you, you begin to talk about Milosevic, Hermann Goering, Tojo, but also Pinochet and Eichmann and Klaus Barbie. So there's always this combination of domestic and international jurisdiction operating um, operating in this field. Yeah, good question, Harsh. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, we'll, we'll have Pragna now and then you'll have Samad. Although I think Samad's internet is erratic, so we keep losing it. Your question. Uh, hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Firstly, Professor, I would like to thank you for such an insightful lecture. So uh, my question is mainly regarding the purpose of war crime uh, trials. So uh, in criminal law, we have learned that the main objective, one of the main objectives is the rehabilitation of the transgressors. But here, my question is in specific to the Nuremberg trials. Here we can see that the ex post facto charges were imposed on the Nazis, and the and Germany didn't even agree to the jurisdiction of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Regardless, we can see that the Allies went to great extent to make sure that Nazis were punished. So, in this sense, can we say that? One of like the main objective of war crime trials is mainly public appeasement over the rehabilitation of the criminals. Yeah, good question. Are you, yeah, uh, An Anke, did you want to take another question uh, first? <laughs> well, I can only add to that. This is uh, uh, this is Judge Paul being uh, echoed through and through. Uh, I'll just leave it there. I'll you can ask this, then then we'll take the next one. Yeah, Pragna, this is a really good question. Um, so, well, there's so much to be said about about this. I think perhaps the the usual objectives of criminal justice are a pretty poor fit for international criminal law if one's looking for justification. So, the classic justifications being sort of deterrence, deterrence just deserts, punishment and rehabilitation. It, 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 as soon as one starts to think about international criminal law in these terms, one runs into trouble. I mean, how do you, how exactly do you go about rehabilitating 
um, individuals who commit widespread acts of, of genocide. What, 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 what does rehabilitation mean in this context? It's, it's hard to think of this in an entirely coherent way, though I do, I do actually think we should be thinking about what happens to convicted war criminals after the trial. We haven't actually thought much about incarceration and imprisonment, though there's beginning to be a move in the scholarship to thinking about precisely where these individuals are transferred to and what, what sort of jail terms that they end up serving. So we could certainly turn our attention to this. I mean, as you said, Nuremberg is a bit of a mixed picture. Uh, 11 individuals are executed. One, one, one commits suicide, of course, before the execution, Hermann Goering. But, but the rest are executed and um, in a courtyard behind the Nuremberg trials. And then their ashes are scattered on the River Issa um, elsewhere. So, um, and then... Other individuals, though, are rehabilitated in a way. I mean, there are three people who are acquitted. And then one of the individuals who is given a, a relatively short jail term, Albert Speer, Hitler's architect, as he was known, uh, goes about rehabilitating himself on British television in the 19, 1960s and 1970s. Um, so I think, I, but I think it's better to think of international criminal law uh, outside the box of classic criminology and to think about the sorts of functions it might perform along the lines of the ones I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, uh, creating a conscience of humankind, for example, performing a form of retribution or legalized vengeance, um, enacting spectacular violence, um, however one however one wants to think about it. And yes, I take your point about ex post factoism, and that's a point that was made in the comments immediately after the, after the lecture too, that, 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 that when we imagine international criminal law as, the, um, as the, those who initiated the whole project back at the beginning of the 20th century did, when we imagine it, we act on what I call the terrain of the unprecedented. Uh, we're dealing with new law, law de novo, and we're applying that law in, a, in an ex post facto or retroactive way, which created serious problems for liberals in, in their encounters with the Nuremberg war crimes trial. But yeah, great, great question, Pragma. I hope that offers some sort of answer to it. Uh, yes, Professor, thank you so much. We've got two more now, and uh, we'll, we've got three now. So we'll have Samat first, because his hand was raised earlier. We'll have Samat, then we'll have Arjun, and then we'll have Akshat. Samat, is it? Uh, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, OK. Good evening, professors. Uh, and thank you to the guest lecturer for a wonderful lecture. So sir, uh, I had a question that comprised both what Mr. Popovsky is teaching us in the class and what you've told us today. So recently we had to write a reflection paper on the topic of the roles of the role of United Nations in peacekeeping. Yeah. So we discussion in a class regarding uh, how a just war can establish just peace. But as we know that such war crimes exist in wars and war has a lot of negative sides as well. So can we still say that a war that has war crimes and which has which also comprises some crimes against humanity can still uh, establish a just peace very good yeah uh do you want to are, are, am i answering each of them individually now ankit or well let's just club them and you can answer them briefly so we'll have akshat and then uh arjun then akshat and then uh, mansi so uh, uh, Akshat, the floor is yours. Keep your question brief and uh, uh, precise. Uh, yes, Professor. So, uh, thank you for the lecture. And my question is uh, more recent. Like, so recently, uh, Patris uh, Eduardo, the militia leader of the Central African Republic, has pleaded not guilty uh, to the war crime charges against him at uh, the International Criminal Court. I think uh, this year itself, uh, sometime a couple of months back. So I just wanted to know that how can we expect that uh, particular trial to uh, go uh, and like what exactly will we be, uh, will the likely outcome be of such a trial? Because uh, 
the evidence against him has been stacked to the floor but still he has uh, decided to plead not uh, guilty especially to the charges of uh, taking in child soldiers and stuff like that so i would just like to know your views on the same yeah uh, arjun arjun we'll have arjun and then we'll have mansi and then uh, we'll, we'll hear the answers and then we can close all right sir so i have i have two questions so first of all sir what is your stand on the impunity versus retributive justice debate and uh, secondly do you think that criminal prosecution is a step forward uh, step in the positive direction for the human rights movement yeah what was the first question arjan again i didn't catch that the the, the sound went off so what is your stand on the impun- impunity versus retributive justice debate yeah ah, i see i see yes good yep good and we'll have mansi good evening professor my question is that as we've seen the tokyo trials most of the military heads that were persecuted were faced with sentences much shorter than they should have considering the severity of their war crimes do you believe that there were external forces at hand in this lenient judgments like we see america's influence in the unit 731 human experiments yeah yeah great so is that those are the questions as of now <laughs> Yeah, well, these are <laughs> these are very good questions. I guess, my goodness, maybe I should take them in reverse, uh, and I will be brief uh, because I know you, you've got other classes to go to and so on. Um, first of all, Manasi, um, yeah, it's a very good point. It's surprising how lenient sentencing is uh, in war crimes tribunals, at least. at least since nuremberg um many people object to this they object to the fact that the international criminal tribunals in the 1990s and the icc today can't uh can't sentence individuals to death can't apply the death penalty to convicted uh defendants uh, and others are dismayed by the fact that the, the sentences at the icctr in arusha were relatively light compared to comparable sentencing regimes in rwanda itself so it seems to be an advantage for the defendant or the convicted war criminal to be tried before an international criminal court uh, as opposed to a domestic court i mean if i was to commit war crimes then i would certainly far rather be tried before an international criminal tribunal than an equivalent domestic tribunal and this is a this is a puzzle but i suppose the international community um or the the the, the states that set up these bodies um are concerned to are concerned to emphasize the rational and somewhat non-vengeful nature that they assume lies behind or um lies behind the international criminal tribunals um but your specific question was about tokyo and i think that's right i think it's been fairly well established that at least decisions not to try people at all were influenced by um us engagement with certain japanese forces uh and groups in the post war era the med- you know medical c- chemical weapons experiment biological weapons experimental unit that you mentioned being a good example um by a concern to rehabilitate the japanese state uh, and also in the case of the um the emperor emperor hirohito uh, motivated by concern to ensure that he and his family had complete immunity uh, in order again to facilitate a smooth transfer of power to the united states with the emperor remaining in a figurehead role so i think you answered your own question there in a way that, that there are often political reasons for uh for the relatively lenient sentences or for decisions not to prosecute um at all Arjan where do I stand on impunity well I I I want to say I'm against it like most people but there is of course a uh, an argument that anti impunity the idea of prosecuting people for breaches of human rights has become the dominant strain of human rights law or the dominant mood 
in the human rights movement and that that's a shame, that that's a mistake, that's a road that should not have been taken, that human rights law uh, works better in other settings, either through truth commissions, through the political process, through forms of redistribution, through human rights committees, through persuasion, through the idea of prisoners of conscience, through NGOs. And instead, what we've done um, is we've we've reallocated authority and political capital and energy to the idea of prosecution and away from these other human rights instrumentalities. Um, actually, the, um, the, the, the CAR prosecution, well, I think it's surprising how well defendants, I think this will be borne out in this case to a certain extent, how well defendants can do in war crimes prosecutions. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to secure uh, a conviction um, and it's particularly difficult for major crimes, as it turns out. So if we think back to the Milosevic trial, which I know didn't reach any sort, sort of conclusion, but it was by no means obvious that Milosevic would be convicted of, of crimes against humanity and genocide in particular, because sometimes it's very hard to show that an individual had agency in relation to these sorts of structural crimes. Or that in the case of recruiting child uh, child soldiers, there wasn't a kind of uh, a norm uh, which, in a way, permitted the societal use of child soldiers at a certain age. Or in the case of uh, a leadership cadre, whether the leadership actually knew or indeed ought to have known under the under the mode of liability known as command responsibility, whether they knew or should have known that, that child soldiers were being used in the first place. So the application of law to mass criminality turns out to be much more ambiguous than we had imagined, or in some cases, in some cases, hoped. Um, Samat, um, I'm struggling to remember that far back, but I think this was a question about whether we would always choose uh, a just peace or whether we might just simply choose peace. And I guess I'd finish by going back to the very beginning of international law and its European phase, at least, at Westphalia, where the peacemakers at Westphalia in 1648 were very keen not to have war crimes trials, to use an anachronistic term um, and apply it to that particular moment. And, and in fact, said that the best thing to do was to forget, uh, was to forget the troubles that had taken place during the various wars that led up to Westphalia and to offer up a sort of amnesty is the word that's used, an impunity uh, in the name of in the name of the Samar, I've, I've remembered the question, I think, in the name of in the name of peacemaking, to choose peace over a just peace can sometimes produce a better outcome than um, obsessively prosecuting individuals one accuses of having committed war crimes during those troubles. But that relationship between amnesty and criminality, you know, sits at the very heart, at the very heart of this of this field. And the answers aren't always the answers aren't always obvious. Great questions, though. Really, really good. Very stimulating. Thanks. Well, I'll, well, I'll, I'll give you a couple of uh, uh, remarks or just points which I've been thinking about through the lecture. Uh, you've mentioned Versailles, you mentioned Nuremberg, you mentioned Dadich. Perhaps what you can add to this is Almadi. Because Almadi grows in the scholarship in a very different perspective as well, which touches upon aspects of international cultural heritage, now, which, is, which is groundbreaking. It's something, it's something which is, uh, is, it's something which is cutting edge when it comes to studying international criminal law. The other point which I wanted to mention is Aaron. I actually read Aaron, and I read Aaron when I was introduced to to Eichmann trials, and then Aaron seeks to reimagine this perspective. And, and as you mentioned, the the the, the banality of evil and, and her conceptualization of that. The other one which I just wanted to highlight, the other point which I want to highlight is, is that Professor Vasky drafted a, has written a chapter on Raphael Lemkin on the dawn of the discipline in, in uh, uh, for a book. And uh, in that book was another chapter on uh, 
Paul, Justice Paul, and that that's written by scholars of Jindal University itself. So that's another proud moment for us. But on Paul, let me just share a couple of thoughts, and then I'll move swiftly towards someone who who I quite who I admire quite a lot, that is Winston Churchill. But on on Paul, let me share that in 2007, the Japanese Prime Minister visited India, and he went to he addressed the Parliament and then went to Calcutta. Which, which is in the eastern parts of the country, and he visited Paul's son. And, and in 1966, Paul was awarded the Order of Japan, uh, Order of the Sacred Treasure First Class by the Emperor of Japan on the country's highest honors. And and uh, uh, this this is a moment which is this monument is also dedicated to Paul at, at, in Tokyo itself, which commemorates the Japanese war heroes. But trying these, the, and this is the critical assessment that Paul made of. Uh, just Spal made on on the case, and he he said that by trying these defendants under these these different charges, the tribunal was going against every accepted legal procedure and principle. The indictments themselves were invalid. In his 1,235 pages dissenting judgment order, Professor uh, Simpson, he said that the tribunal was a sham employment of legal processes for satisfaction of a thirst of revenge. <laughs> he pointed to the failure of the tribunal to provide anything other than the opportunity for the victors to retaliate. He concluded by saying that I would hold that every one of the accused must be found to be not guilty of every one of the charges in the indictment and should be acquitted on all charges. In recent years, his his this this has become the 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 modus operandi for the Japanese revisionist and, and they've used this as to 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 not wage wars and and and, and uh, get involved in such issues. But Paul would not have been placed to to be a part of that. He would have never supported the Japanese in such an endeavor. And he would have said that Japan could not have could not have and should not have signed out for this imperialist lust. In fact, in a speech he delivered at the at, at Hiroshima Hiroshima in 1952, uh, he, he said that if Japan wishes to possess military power again. Then would then would what would have been the defilement against the souls of the victims in Hiroshima? Paul would have been Paul would be in Tokyo when India. Now this is perhaps an explanation of why Paul was so strongly opinionated when it came came. It's the cultural roots. It's the colonial experience. He said that this is just an understanding. Is that uh, he would have been in Tokyo when India gained freedom. And his 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 village that he belonged must have become East Pakistan, and and these events back home would have been played massive role on his mind when he was in a foreign land. As one of the authors in their address, he says that this is a first as the sole representative of the colonized world, and then of a newly free people. Uh, so self determination play must have played an extremely significant role in 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 explaining this this, but. So I'll, I'll close with Churchill now. Now Churchill is someone who I've studied quite deeply and 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 tried to make sense of as a, as, a, as not only a personality but also as 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 how how he he himself grew in in past. I mean, I, I in fact visited the Churchill War Rooms as well. This is just off the St James's Park in on Clive Road. It's a wonderful walk and it's a, uh, it's, it's quite riveting being there. And uh, I studied Churchill in a different light. I studied Churchill in human rights, and I studied him in the context of the European uh, Charter for Human Rights. And then I've, I've been, I received word for my presentation. I received word from, and I'm quite proud of this. Is I received word from his great grandson. This is Randolph Churchill, who wants to wants me to speak for the International Churchill Society on Churchill's endeavors for human rights. So basically, what I'm trying to highlight is that personalities in themselves can play an instrumental role. But someone like Paul has been forgotten in history. He's forgotten in history, in not only in the Indian imagination, but there I see also in the Japanese imagination. There is not much that is discussed of Paul in the Indian courts and the Indian judiciary, which is a rather unfortunate part. And uh, same can be said for other Indian heroes as well. Uh, think no further than than B. R. Ambedkar, who's now really been started to be become an important figure. His, there is another statue which has been laid, or a bust which has been laid down in Grace Court, uh, and uh, 
these are just figments of imagination and commemoration. These heroes deserve far much more to the values, the systems which they have contributed. And uh, it should really start from scholarship because scholarship will grant you clarity on these persons and allow you to have different understandings of one person, which is the essence of not only scholarship, but also reading and writing history. I just wanted to share these comments, Jared. I think I was strongly about it. Yeah, yeah, great comments. What a, what a nice little epilogue to my uh, to my lecture. Um, I mean, I, there's so much to say about Paul. I'm a big admirer of Barry Hill's recent book, uh, Peacemongers, which uh, talks about uh, Paul and Tagore, and uh, and uh, yeah, I commend that to you. But I didn't, I didn't notice that when you picked up my rent, you. Uh, pointed to the cover, and I, I knew that it wasn't Eichmann in Jerusalem, but it, that it was the origins of totalitarianism, as far as I could see. And that may be the way into this through our end, not through the familiar commentary or reportage on the, uh, on the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, but through her wider political work on totalitarianism itself, which offers a very, very useful, more than gloss on our concerns with the Nuremberg and, and to a lesser extent, Tokyo war crimes tribunals. But yeah, great, great comment. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Bobowski, uh, final words? Uh, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, I really appreciate all, uh, your excellent uh, lecture, but also the responses to the questions, which gave us a lot of uh, d deep uh, reimagination of how international criminal law has been uh, developed and what, what are still the, the issues which we are facing uh, so many years later. Well, what I wanted also to add into the discussion about peace and justice uh, is interesting to think that uh, the two go very well together, but they should be exercised by uh, separate agencies, so to speak. And uh, we witness a lot of confusion between uh, expectations that uh, international tribunals need to care about peace. And that's certainly not the case. International tribunals were never created as to be part of the peace instruments. Peace agencies should be separate from the justice agencies. Uh, if we mix the two, nothing will work. We cannot expect prosecutors to deliver peace. Actually, the opposite. We can expect prosecutors to jeopardize peace sometimes. Leave the peace to the peacemakers and peacekeepers and the negotiators and people like Brahimi, Kofi Annan, etc. And uh, let the prosecutors do their work independently from the question of peace, reconciliation and so on. And the opposite, I will say the peacekeepers and the peacemakers should not be asked to go to tribunals and serve as witnesses. I remember talking to Yasushi Akashi, for example, a Japanese uh, United Nations official who served as the Secretary General Special Representative in Cambodia, then in Yugoslavia, who felt very uncomfortable to go to the Milosevic or to the Karadzic trials and to serve as witness there. He was a peacemaker. Peacemakers mm. have different jobs. They can say to someone to disappear in the forest and never come back. That's what the peacemakers do. Their job is not to deliver justice. So in other words, peace and justice go very well hand in hand long term, but the, the two tasks need to be exercised by completely separate agencies. Otherwise, uh, we, we will face problems. Thank you once again, everybody, Gary Simpson in particular, Ankit for organizing, all the students who asked the questions. It was a terrific uh, experience and we learn a lot today. Thank so, you, everyone. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you. A small question, uh, Professor Simpson, if, if I may. Sure. Yeah. Uh, in India, uh, if I give an example of India, there is an issue with regards to uh, ICC's jurisdiction. India hasn't ratified the Rome Statute and the issues, there are a couple of issues which India has, but the issue which I 
would like your views on is the prosecutor's suo moto cognizance of the of uh, of criminal law issues. So there are various issues in India like Kashmir, which are debatable, or in the past Gujarat or Punjab. So how do you how do you see this kind of issues which member states portray or or non signatories portray like India? How do you see that getting resolved in the future if it if it does? Um. I think I won't answer that. <laughs> I think I won't answer that question because I'd rather really hear from you on that. I'm not familiar enough with the uh, the particular the particular case. I mean, this sounds like an exceedingly uh, tricky matter. And one of the, I mean, I guess I guess what I would what I would recommend is that you take a look at my book on uh, the reinvention of international law, law, war and crime, where I try and see my way through these sorts of issues, which seem to involve some sort of politics, law relationship, um, but which I then disassemble and deconstruct, particularly in the opening chapter on laws, on laws politics. So that's my very exceedingly abstract end of the one and a half hour uh, answer to the question. Thank you, thank you. Actually, I, I can be less diplomatic and do a, uh, answer that in a way that I, I disagree with every single Indian objection on the Rome Statute of the ICC, but <laughs> it's probably an issue of another lecture. Definitely the Article 15 proprio motto prosecutor's power is uh, is extremely important and uh, it actually shows that that's another option another avenue when the security council is silent and doesn't do anything or when the member states may not go after their own war criminals and that's why it comes to the prosecutor that power of the prosecutor is extremely important and cannot really be any objection to that and the, the idea that a prosecutor may come after Prime Minister Modi for something committed long time ago is definitely not even hypothetical. So it's, it, it's, it's taken from nowhere objection. The other objection of the Indian government is that the crime of terrorism is not put into the statute. Again, I, I consider that to be a ridiculous uh, objection. Uh, you can find a lot of uh, crimes in the statute that actually cover acts of terrorism, targeting civilians and so on. Again, uh, the debate about terrorism has been too long and at the end it doesn't help to think about adding additional criminality on terrorism in the Rome Statute. Terrorism has been dealt with elsewhere a lot in the United Nations system through the Security Council resolutions. There is a separate mechanisms to deal with terrorism everywhere. And it's not the job of the ICC statute to deal with that. Uh, I can't remember the third objection, but again, it, it was something very silly anyway. So that there are no good arguments made by the Indian government against the Rome statute for the ICC. Thank, thank you, Professor Popolsky. Thank you. So uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Simpson. We'll hear from you next week. Uh, this is a two-part series which we have with you. We're so grateful to have you for two lectures. And I thank everyone else also for being here. Thank you, Professor Popowski, and also uh, respected students. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Simpson, once more. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. Hope to see you again yes. one day. Welcome yes. to India. Definitely. The I'll be there as soon as things open up. I'd love to come. Please do. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.